Another question, Paisios, I might have already answered this, is the question of exactitude and economia found in the ecumenical councils? Does that make it a dogmatic issue? If so, um, the question of exactitude in economia. Now, this, this question of economia goes back until very early. I said St. Basil. Uh, right now, there's another name uh, in the... Roman Empire, and I'm trying to remember his name right now. He was a patron of Constantinople who writes about this, and I cannot remember it. Unfortunately, I don't have my library uh, with me right now. Um, so it's not disputed. Economia, no one disputes that there is economia. The only, dis, the, the, the only uh, objection comes in the 20th century with its application to the reception of uh, converts to the Orthodox Church. Economia as a, and ecrivia as two ways to govern the church is universally accepted. Now, why they object in its application in this case, well, that's a good question. And there's, uh, there's, uh, there's you know, discussions of that among uh, scholars like Florovsky. Um, but it's not questioned in the Orthodox world of St. Nicodemus and the Golivadi's fathers. There's no question as to these are the interpretive keys. That's how the church works, whether it be reception of converts or whether it be a canon which calls for so many years of penance, the economy. We all know that. Nobody dis disputes that. So is it discussed in ecumenical councils like cat economia, cat I don't remember. I don't think so. I don't remember anything right now that comes to mind that they use that terminology in the canons. The canons generally are calling for a particular practice. Now they could be in, the canons could be expressed in the economy of the church, like the canons and reception. It's clear because in the same canon, they're saying these people like this and these people like that. So the idea that the canons are always the acrivia is mistaken. I don't know where people get this idea that they express the acrivia. No, canons can also express the economy of the church. So this is what we're going to do in this case with these people, cat Um, So it's not a dogmatic issue per se, but it becomes it it's a it flows from dogma and it and if it's if it's distorted it can represent a heretical idea of the church in other words you have to understand properly christology ecclesiology to understand therefore our pastoral practice and so in that order things are, are worked out so they're inseparable right economia it flows from our our life in the church our experience of christ and our understanding of the body of christ and in that life and context and understanding, then it's applied and then it's understood. So when you see discussions or applications of economy which are inconsistent with that, it usually means you have a, another vision of the church. And so then it does touch on dogma, right? It does touch on dogma in those cases. But in and of itself, not necessarily a dogmatic issue. But again, this distinction, this needs to be really pointed out because this is this whole discussion is in a theoretical basis when we talk about is it dogmatic is it non-dogmatic look folks dogma and ethos are inseparable they're both expressions of our life so you can't you artificially separate them in your mind but in reality they're inseparable they're the one and the same right you can't take my flesh and my spirit you're going to kill me you can't take away the dogma and the ethos you're going to kill the church they're inseparable so in many ways we have defined dogma way too narrowly today again under the influence I think of the West. I don't think that the Orthodox experience tells us to do that. Uh, there's The fathers on Athos are zealous about all the tradition, right? They're not going to say, oh, it's not a dogmatic issue. You can just throw that away. It doesn't happen. So this small tree, T, big tree, T distinction where people think, well, um, you know, this is not, you can do whatever you want over here. That whole approach seems foreign to me when you're around people who are living immersed in the holy tradition like you know the saints on athos or the elders in athos or the monastic uh, the monastics and others that i've experienced that's just not in their mindset they don't make those kind of distinctions only academic theologians make these distinctions right in life in the church we don't make these sharp distinctions like oh is that a dogmatic issue oh that's that's a that's an ethical issue but the the ethos derives from the dogma that's the whole point in orthodoxy dogma is is essentially the expression of the revelation of God, and, and it leads to life in Christ, and therefore the life in Christ, the, the ethos, is, in, is totally inseparable from 
the dogma, the, the teachings and the understanding, which again is inseparable from the revelation and what God has given us. So these distinctions only go so far. Stavrula has a question. A priest that is subject to the erroneous reception, is his parish still worth attending? Well, I don't, I don't think we should ask it so abruptly because obviously we've had this problem going on for 250 years, right? I mean, back in the time of St. Paisios, he was fighting it. I don't think we should, should walk away and say because people don't understand or people don't get it or people aren't following the, the fathers. We should actually struggle to be, uh, a, you know, in some small way, uh, help others to understand this. I mean, that's what I'm doing here tonight. That's why you're here. I think you're here because you want to hear what the saints have to say. And my, that's what I go to the, I go to the contemporary authorities that I know, and I try to get the teaching to offer to you. So do the same. Don't walk away unless there is a heretical mindset, right? One thing to have not understand. It's not one thing to not get it because you've never been exposed to it. It's one thing to be a good will, but just uh, ignorant. Another thing to have a heretical mindset where you're teaching and you're working from a heretical uh, phronema outlook and you're actually saying, for instance, in our day and age, oh, we're all the same. Uh, it's all essentially one church, but we're in, it's partial communion or a new one that's going around, which is shocking to me from people who are very serious. And this has got to stop. If people, people don't realize this, I don't know how, what, what, what to say here. The idea that there is one church, Orthodox church, but there are heretical and heterodox groups that have the Eucharist is a delusional heretical teaching. It is the epitome of ecumenism. And it is nothing, there's no way you can reconcile that with the teachings of the Holy Fathers. There's one church, one Christ, one Lord, one baptism, and that is in communion with one another. There's not, you cannot break and have heretical teachings and break off and, and, of course, with the Monophysites, you have a synodical condemnation, not once, not twice, but four times. I mean, if you want to go up to the Ninth Ecumenical Council, you've got it six times. So the, the, these, these ideas that float around today, I don't, they're not coming from the saints of the Orthodox Church, in my opinion, my experience. Maybe, they're, maybe they think they are because they're, they're reading different saints, church fathers, and then they're, you know, they're trusting their own interpretation of that, and then they get these crazy ideas. It's impossible to talk about one Christ, undivided, one church, undivided, and then talk about the Eucharist existing among those who are divided, manifestly divided from the Orthodox Church. Impossible. And it's just not the, the it's the, the, the church is in the world. It's incarnational. It goes, it, the Lord is, the incarnation continues. It's in a particular time and place. It's the scandal of the particular, folks. you got to crucify your rational intellect and say, I can't figure it all out, but only it's here. It is the manifestation of Christ in the world right now. And I, there's not multiple manifestations of Christ. It's only one. It's, and it's, it's where the full 100% person of Christ is like the pleroma, right? The fullness of the faith is, and that doesn't mean like we count them up and it's all hundred percent. That means the person of Christ is there and he can't be chopped up. We have a little bit of Christ over here, a little bit of Christ over there. That's not Christ anymore. That's an idea about Christ. That's teachings about Christ. You can have all kinds of different teachings about Christ, but there's only one place where you find the person of Christ incarnate, giving himself and given in every mystery. And when that is not in communion with another synaxis and the same teaching and the same grace and the same uh, experience, then that other place is not the real thing. It's that simple. 